Um, so hello again, my name is Kelly Brucker. I am the lead career coach at Tech Elevator. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Tech Elevator, we are a coding boot camp. Um, while our uh, Mission Central team sits in Cleveland, where that's the mothership, we also have locations in Pittsburgh, Detroit, Columbus, Cincinnati, um, and Philadelphia, which is our newest location, and they're getting ready to graduate their first ever cohort of students, which is very exciting. Um, so, like I mentioned, we are a coding boot camp, and people who are interested in changing up their careers and becoming software developers um, come to Tech Elevator. So, we help career changers pretty much. We have people who come from marketing, sales, healthcare, education backgrounds, and they're now working as software developers. We are at a point where we have graduated uh, close to 1,500 students, um, which is amazing and really exciting. We just graduated um, our most recent group from Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Detroit, and Pittsburgh on Friday, actually. So we graduated 250 students, um, some who've already accepted job offers, and the rest who are still actively interviewing. Um, so if you're ever interested in learning more about Tech Elevator, uh, please make sure to go to our website um, and you can find out more information. Um, but we're really excited to share some of our content from our Pathway program with you guys, um, which is where the career conversations come from. So our Pathway program runs right in line with everything the students learn in the classroom. So in addition to learning how to code, our students are uh, gaining some awesome soft skills, which are really important when you're looking for a job. Um, so this is our third um, weekly career conversations uh, session, and this week we are really excited to have a panel format. So we've invited four wonderful um, folks from our different campuses. Um, so I want to go ahead and just go around and have them all introduce <laughs> themselves. Uh, so if you guys could just talk about, uh, you know, uh, introduce yourself, your name, the company you currently work at, your role, and a little background on your experience um, in conducting interviews. Um, okay, I can start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so my name is Jennifer Householder. Um, I sit in our Cleveland, Ohio um, area. Um, I work for National General Insurance as a senior uh, technical recruiter. Um, so I specialize uh, for the most part within um, IT related roles, um, but obviously as a company, we, you know, we do support all types of roles from, um, you know, sales to customer service to um, claims and different things like that. Um, I have been in this particular role with National General Insurance for, um, it'll be a year next month. Um, but I've been, you know, working in recruiting for um, about five years now. Um, so, you know, definitely have kind of seen, um, you know, this is, I would say this has definitely been, uh, you know, the first in terms of doing a lot more remote interviewing, but certainly not the first time we've, you know, ever done it. So, um, you know, I think just adapting um, has been the biggest thing for us and um, it's going well. So. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, <laughs> hi, my name's uh, Jason Demko. Uh, I'm with Bank of New York Mellon. Um, our corporate office is in New York. However, I sit in our Pittsburgh office, which is our largest technical hub uh, for the organization. Uh, I'm the vice president, vice president of technology talent acquisitions. Um, I support roughly 7,000 uh, technical resources within the uh, bank. Uh, we are the largest financial services company in the country and uh, roughly 58,000 employees. Uh, currently, we have 56,000 employees working from home and or remote with 2,000 critical employees going on site. So we've uh, jumped into the deep end uh, when it comes to remote uh, working, remote interviewing, um, and doing everything from our uh, home offices. So looking forward to answering your questions and uh, Hopefully we can help you guys out a little bit. I can jump in next. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mike Borelli and I'm joining from Philadelphia uh, with Vanguard. Uh, so we're a financial services company as well, um, based out in the suburbs of Philadelphia in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Um, but we are in a similar boat of moving all of our recruiting and uh, just kind of branding and recruitment activity to uh, the virtual delivery method. 
Um, our organization is about 17,000 employees, or as we call them, crew members. We've got about 95% of those uh, crew members working remotely as well. So definitely some, some trying times and time of just new and innovative solutions for us. Um, but excited to be here. This is our first time uh, partnering with Tech Elevators. They've just opened their first cadre in the office or uh, school in, in Philadelphia. So thankful to be here um, and hope everyone's doing well. Hi everyone, I'm Sydney Taroff. I work at Cover My Meds. We're a medication access company, um, equally healthcare to um, technology. We like to say we're a health tech company. Um, I've been recruiting here for a little over a year, um, but I think almost four years um, total. And um, when it comes to interviewing at Cover My Meds, we've always been very flexible. Um, so we've always had um, people be able to interview remotely. So not much has changed, um, just more of it is remote than before. Um, but we're always looking for ways to, to make our candidate experience better. And um, I think remote has kind of been that trend for a couple of years now and just trying to get ahead of it. Yeah. Thank you guys so much and welcome. Um, so as a, you guys already kind of mentioned, you know, what your, what your companies um, are doing, um, but could you guys go on to some more detail about um, kind of how specifically, if it has changed, how your hiring process um, and even maybe your onboarding process, how that has changed and what you guys are doing differently? And whoever wants to start uh, can just jump right in. <laughs> I'll go first, I guess. Uh, this is Jason again with BNY. So, you know, a couple things have changed. Um, typically, our interview process would consist, normally would consist of a telephone interview uh, where we would do a general screening of a candidate to make sure they fit uh, within to our, you know, minimum qualifications. Uh, after that, we would bring them in for a face-to-face -face interview with anywhere from two to three other um, engineers on the team. And then we would usually wrap up with a final, what I call a cup of coffee conversation over the phone, um, you know, and then extend offers that way. Since uh, COVID-19 has hit, you know, that process has changed. Uh, obviously, we can't get together with our candidates, but we still want to give them the experience of getting to know uh, the teams that they're going to be working with, um, giving them the best picture of the organization that we can uh, in a remote setting. So we have moved to uh, video interviews. Uh, we do a lot of WebEx interviews. Uh, we don't necessarily use Zoom internally, but we do use WebEx uh, and some other video uh, tools. Uh, we've added additional, I'll say, resources to the interview team. So where you may have done two or three interviews in the past for the position, we may have three, or four or five people talk to you at this point. Um, that way you're getting a more well-rounded look. Since you can't see the facility, we're hoping that by talking to more people, they can you know, elaborate on and answer additional questions for you. Um, as far as... No, I'll stop there. I'll let somebody else jump in and, you know, kind of go over their stuff. I don't want to talk too much. Um, I can jump in. I mean, I would say for us, um, we have certainly, um, you know, adapted to using Zoom for the most part um, for our virtual interviews. Um, you know, it allows our teams to be able to screen share and still be able to have, you know, a face-to-face -face interaction um, with the person, you know, it, it, it hasn't changed a ton as we're, you know, we are a national company. So um, it's not that we, you know, we always did do, you know, virtual interviews. Um, but, you know, in the past, we would use Skype and it would, um, you know, skip and things like that. So Zoom has definitely been a better option for us. Um, but, you know, I, I would say, you know, just trying to paint a bigger picture for um, the interviewer, um, since they can't see the office, since they can't go in, um, you know, there's nothing better than a handshake. And, you know, obviously we can't have that anymore. So, you know, just I'd say on both ends, both the interviewer and the interviewee, um, you know, we've, we've been trying as a company to do a better job of um, just you know, keeping it exciting and, you know, having some of that, um, you know, beginning type, break the ice type questions, just as you would as if you were, you know, walking to an office with that person. Um, and, you know, our interviews have definitely been going longer as well, just to kind of add some of that, because um, ultimately you're going to have a lot more questions being that, you know, you can't physically go into an office. Um, but, 
you know, all in all, I'd say, you know, for us, it's definitely been, um, you know, a, not much has changed in terms of our onboarding um, or our hiring. We are still hiring, um, you know, in most cases, um, you know, just from an onboarding perspective, we've been doing paperwork via Zoom if it's possible. If not, you know, if people are comfortable doing a quick, you know, one in the office, um, dropping off paperwork, being able to see the office on the first day and then, you know, taking their equipment and going remote from there. So I guess it kind of depends on the location, but, um, you know, we've been accommodating really whatever makes sense for that state um, at the time. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. <laughs> yeah, and I can jump in and build from there, just um, on the onboarding experience or recruiting process is looking pretty similar. Um, even pre-COVID, we had a hacker rank mm -hmm. assessment built into our interview process. So candidates are receiving that virtually and getting the chance to complete that assessment just to show their technical aptitude. Um, and then similar a second round of uh, just the in-person interviews after that, but making sure we're giving the space and time for people to get a feel of the culture and the teams that they'll be working with, um, although remote mm -hmm. for the time being. Um, but from the onboarding perspective, we in a similar way um, have tried to be just really thoughtful about what can we do virtually and what do um, incoming crew members need to do in person versus what can be done um, remotely. For those who are in need of technology, um, we've set up kind of like a drive-through contactless delivery of Vanguard systems to those new um, employees that are coming to the organization. So um, we're, we're giving people the opportunity to just basically drive their car through one of our offices, get the equipment that they need, return to their home, and do uh, the rest of their onboarding virtually. So i um, pretty proud of the organization in that sense. Um, and then we're even thinking through in the onboarding pieces, how do we still show some of those fun, like cultural things that we would do in a traditional um, in-person onboarding, just virtually. So trying to balance that like business piece with that social connection, just recognizing how important that continues to be as you're joining the firm. Uh, Mike, I love how you bring up uh, the culture aspect because that's definitely mm -hmm. something, especially in the last few years, it's so, so much more important um, for companies and even for candidates is the culture of the company. It's something I know at Tech Elevator, um, we, we put, uh, we, we look at very heavily. So how have you guys been able to communicate kind of that cult, that company culture with your candidates during remote interviews? I know culture typically comes out when the candidates come on site and get the tour. So how are you guys able to do that now um, in a remote world? I can, yeah, it's, it's, oh, oh sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no you go. That, was, that was a question to you. It's all good. You, you go. No, all good. Um, well, yeah, feel free to jump in um, with, with ideas here too, because it, it's a tough question. And I think it's one that um, I'm not gonna say we have it perfected by any means. We're continuing to learn and just kind of grow and, and looking for feedback from both internal partners as well as um, those external candidates that are meeting with us. Um, in the time being, I think we're being really thoughtful about just kind of exposing people to what we have been doing in these remote environments to really prioritize the safety, health, well-being of our employees and also our um, clients. Um, we're a very client-focused uh, financial services and technology company. So um, even bringing into the conversation how we've shifted both our internal systems to allow people to work remotely, but then externally, how we ramped up our online presence or our presence on mobile apps for our clients to be able to still connect with Vanguard while um, we're in this capacity. And then I was going to piggyback off of that and say... Um, for, for Cover My Meds, we're a much smaller company um, than the rest of the folks here. And so um, our, our campus has really been like our, our bragging um, point. And thankfully, our marketing team had been working over the last couple months on um, really creating some of those culture videos that we're now allowed to um, present to candidates. And so that's been a really exciting way um, so, to show off our culture a little bit um, since we can't show off our, our actual um, campus just yet. Um, so if you're able to partner with marketing um, for the rest of y'all, it's it's been really great um, with with all the like prep interviews that are prep um, emails that I send to candidates. I make sure to send a couple links and um, get people really excited that way. Um, and then for onboarding too, um, just to keep the excitement up, we use um, Slack for internal communication and we'll do like random Slack calls kind of catch you off guard. Um, but for me over the last month, it's helped me a ton. And um, I know that candidates are, or like new, um, new uh, employees are like, oh, wow, like I got a random Slack call from Sydney the other day. That was fun. Just to, to keep the momentum up, just because it, you know, for people who don't want to work at home, I know it's not for everyone. So you have to keep the energy up. 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, and for attendees, just a reminder to continue uh, submitting those questions in the Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen. Um, for our panelists, if you have a question, please submit it. And Andrea will make sure to uh, uh, read those to the panelists at the end. Um, so let's talk about kind of best practices for remote interviews, because those are a little bit different. Um, you know, it's so important for candidates to, to dress up and put some effort into the, their appearance. Um, so what would, would, would you say is your best piece of advice for candidates um, for a remote interview that's different for an in-person or maybe a phone interview? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in oh, first. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> I'll, I'll follow. All right. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say, I, I think that, you know, I mean, this goes on both ends, both the interviewers and, as well as the interviewee, but um, as simple as it sounds by, you know, just be prepared as if, you know, you were in, going on an on-site interview, you know, you wouldn't, if you were on site, you would obviously be dressed, you know, appropriately, you would not have distractions of your phone or a TV or anything like that. I mean, by all means, you know, we are all human and, and we are all working from home. So if you have kids at home or a barking dog or something, you know, I would say, you know, up front, maybe just let the interviewer know that, um, you know, that, hey, there might be a distraction. I have a two-year-old at home. You know, there's only so much you can do about that. Um, but trying your best to, um, you know, step away from the distractions and find a place um, within, within your home or apartment that, um, you know, that you can kind of be alone without distractions just to keep everything quiet and engaged. Um, you know, at the end of the day, since you aren't sitting directly across from a person anymore, um, you know, it's, it's, we should still treat it as if you are. So, um, you know, I think that would probably be my advice on my end. Yeah, and a lot of that's exactly what I was going to say as well. The only thing I'll add to that from my side is be comfortable. Um, you know, talking into a computer camera is not a natural act for a lot of people. Uh, if you don't do it on a daily basis. So you can come off looking very robotic. You can come off looking very stiff. And as a company, I still want to try to read your body language throughout the interview to see if you're excited, to see if you're sitting forward in your seat when I'm talking. You know, if, it, if it's grabbing your attention, you want to be yourself. You, you, you have to be natural, um, you know. That's probably the biggest advice that I can give somebody is don't change just because you're on a camera. Uh, let them see your mannerisms. Let them see you talking with your hands. Um, you know, let your your personality come through as much as possible um, in the video, because that might be the only chance you're going to get to to show them that you have a personality. And you know, let's be honest. I hire people. We hire people that we like and can work with, even if they lack a little bit of the skills. I can teach you the skills. I can't make myself want to work with you. Yeah, Jason, I think that's a really great point. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do, whether it's interviews or internal meetings, just the reminder of like, it is still a conversation. There's a human at the other end of the line, as uncomfortable as, you know, talking to a phone or a computer can be. Um, making sure you're still finding time and ways to make that human connection, whether it's, you know, checking on the person on the other end's family or how they've been just emotionally responding to COVID and the uh, social distancing. So it's a great reminder. The other thing on kind of building upon that too, um, with the body language, I think about too, just smiling and the facial expressions and the active listening that you can do in person, you can still really do all that virtually too. Um, so there's definitely ways to show engagement uh, virtually in the same way that you could in person during an interview. So I would recommend keeping that in every way that you can. Um, what about on the other side of that, any red flags or mistakes that people can potentially make in, an, in a remote interview again specifically that right away you're going to be like, oh, you know what, I can't get past that and it's going to be an automatic no or it's going to be, like I said, a red flag for you. I have one top of I, mind. I guess, oh, no, you got yeah. yeah, I was going to say, you know, the only real big thing for me is if I'm interviewing somebody and they're constantly looking down away from the camera. Um, you know, to me, it's okay. Are they searching for the answer? I mean, it's okay to have that, that silent pause while you think of an answer, but if your eyes are constantly heading down or off here to the side, you know, are you looking stuff up? Are you Googling it on a separate machine? Um, 
you know, when you step into the interview, you should pretty much know your resume at that point. So if I'm asking you questions on your resume, chances are you don't need to look down at your resume to, to answer that question. You lived through it. You should have prepared for that. Um, that would be a red flag for me that something's not um, adding up here. Yeah, that's a good one. The other thing that I was thinking about too, um, just as you're meeting with people, I think this time in particular is really kind of elevating the need to be flexible and manage ambiguity with different, you know, mm -hmm. technologies, platforms, whatever it is, like ways of meeting. So something I've been very mindful of as a meeting with candidates is if they're sharing feedback around like the platform, um, how are they doing so? Is it, you know, in a very negative tone or is it this positive, like, yeah, I had a few issues, but work through it, happy to be here. Because um, I think that's just kind of telling of how people are going to be able to adapt and flex in environments like these where so much is kind of up in the air um, for the next few months in particular. Um, yeah, I would just say, I mean, it's kind of building the opposite of what I just said by, you know, the same thing of just, um, you know, it is still an interview. So, you know, if possible, try not to look like you just rolled out of bed, um, you know, be not looking at your phone. Like whenever I'm on these, I always set my phone to silent um, or do not disturb. So, you know, even if I get a call, I don't even realize it because it's, you know, again, we probably wouldn't have our phones on loud if we were sitting face to face with someone. Um, I think if someone like answered their phone while on it, it would be a little bit of a red flag. But again, you know, if, if it's something that you know you're going to need to, just communicate that in the beginning. Hey, I, you know, my, my parents are watching my kid. They might call me during the interview. Again, we're all human and that's okay. Um, but I think communicating that up front would be better. Um, you know, one of the big positives of being able to, you know, have a remote type interview versus in person is you can have all your notes in front of you. Um, so, you know, spread them out to a point to, you know, Jason's point, where we're not like constantly looking down, but, you know, I have the questions that you sent us, Kelly, up kind of propped up right now, so they're still there. Um, so, you know, you do have that advantage of being able to have some of that stuff in front of you um, that you may not when you're, you know, in person, but again, just stay as engaged and looking at the camera as you can. Yeah, all, all the things that you wouldn't do in person, like don't do it on, on here, you know? <laughs> Um, you're not going to answer your, your phone in the middle of an interview or a text. Um, so I would say all, all the things that you would do in person, just don't do it on, on Zoom or virtual. Everything they said, I agree with. Awesome. Thank you. Guys. I love your, your final point, Sydney. That's something we've definitely been telling our students at Tech Elevator is, you know, just because these interviews are remote, treat them as if you're in person. Um, it's the mm -hmm. best thing you can do. Um, so what about the technology? You know, everyone now has to be, uh, has to get used to these new softwares, Zoom and Google Hangouts and GoTo, and I could probably go on all day with the list of all these different softwares. Um, you know, every company has a specific software that they use. Um, so candidates have to, you know, take time to download it and test the software. So if a candidate is not able to figure out the software, is that a red flag to you guys? Or how do you handle those situations? I can start only um, like hiring them as tech support. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I ahead, tossed Mike that one Jennifer, out. Go ahead. Yeah, this is, I feel like I tossed that one out in the things of not to do in in the interview tips. So I'll, um, I'll start there and, and definitely jump in with your thoughts, guys. But um, for me, I think it's okay if you can't figure out the technology, but more so like how you're responding to not being able to mm -hmm. understand the technology or get onto the technology is the kind of key part. Um, if you're visibly frustrated or if you're like, you know, cursing the technology, like that's not going to be a great sign <laughs> for your interviewer. Um, if you're creative and kind of thinking through, okay, I can't access it on this device, but let me try another device. And again, just showing how you're resilient. Um, I think that's going to be a win for the interviewer. Um, but I don't think there's any shame in uh, not being able to be really comfortable with the technology yeah. in your first time around. I would say too, I think with, with most of the platforms, you are able to test ahead of time. So do that if possible. Um, you know, again, it's, if you have troubles or your Wi-Fi cuts out, I mean, it is what it is and, and it's how you respond to it. Like, like Michael said, um, but, you know, I, I think at the same time, if you're trying to jump on for a 10 a.m. interview at 10 a.m. and you can't get it to work and your phone dies or, well, you know, whatever, I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a point of preparation that goes into it as well. 
um, and, you know, making sure that everything is working before you jump on it. Awesome. Great. Some great tips. Um, so what, um, I, I know you guys have talked about like kind of testing the software. How specifically can, can they test it and what should they be doing when they test it? Yeah, um, I can, I can start us off. So at least for, for us, we'll send out, um, a link, like when we confirm the interview, like here's where your interview will be, test this link out, please respond to this, let me know that you've tested it to kind of confirm like, okay, this works, you've done it. Um, and if you, if it's not working, like let's, let's figure it out together. I know we use um, a tool that you can also dial in, um, you know, if, if for some reason video, if you don't have a camera or video is not working, we'll do, we'll do a phone call, we'll do like, we'll dial in. We can be as flexible as we need to be. Um, to help accommodate you. Um, we don't want technology to be the reason that you, you don't get a job or you don't get the opportunity right. to interview. Awesome. Um, so really quick, what software do you guys use specifically at your companies to do interviews? If, everybody, ever, if everyone can just go around and say. Um, we, use, we use Zoom for the most part right now. Um, or we do have Skype as well, though we're not using that quite as often. Um, we're mostly using Zoom or, of course, good old phone. So, <laughs> and we're using WebEx. Um, every everybody who would do interviews has a WebEx account, and we can send them out. That's a little bit more secure for our our environment. Um, so, WebEx as it is for BNY Mellon. Yeah, and then at Vanguard, we're using Microsoft Teams as well as WebEx. We are using blue jeans. Not many people use that one. Um, but if a candidate, um, depending on the role, makes it to a final round interview, we will create um, a guest Slack channel for them and put all of the people that they're interviewing with in that room so everyone can kind of talk and collaborate together. Um, and we usually keep the room open for a day or two so that if there are questions before and after the interview, they can still get them answered by those teammates. Oh, that's awesome. And that actually leads really well into my next question about um, how are you guys incorporating other team members in interviews? I know um, at uh, most of your companies, that's a, that's a big part. There's not just one person that's doing the interview. There are several team members and sometimes that's a panel interview. Um, so how are you guys in, incorporating the different team members in these interviews? Um, whoever wants to start off. I can, I can start. Um, I think as a recruiter who partners regularly with hiring teams, I'm making sure they're just as prepared as the candidate. Um, so I make sure that they have questions. Um, I think it's easy in person to just do like a free flowing kind of whoever's ready to ask a question, but I think it's a little more structured now on, on the company's part. I um, make sure everyone has at least one question so that no one's kind of sitting there silently on, on the video call because it's a little more obvious than in person. Um, and yeah, then that way all of the, the employees and, and teammates can still feel like they have a, a role in the interview. And then I already talked about the Slack thing, but that's always a fun one to get everyone involved. Yeah, I would say, I mean, for, for us, typically we do have multiple members on, on the call. So, um, you know, it's to, to Sydney's point, normally they are um, coming up with questions so that each person does have a question to ask, um, but not all asking at the same time. So I, it's actually been a little bit less of, um, from a recruiting standpoint, more so within each particular group, but um, that I know they've met and talked through, you know, kind of a, a system of who's going to talk when, um, so not everyone's talking at the same time. And then we've also been using screen sharing via Zoom. So um, you know, from a technical portion, we can still ask those technical questions just as we would, you know, again, if you were sitting in front of the person. So, um, you know, I think we've been kind of still using Zoom, but doing it that way. Yeah, and we're, we're doing probably a little bit different. So most of our interviews are one-on-one, -on -one, uh, manager or um, team member and the candidate. Um, very rarely. Uh, do we have more than one team member on the video calls with the uh, candidate? Uh, 
not because we don't want to, uh, usually because schedules don't align, um, you know, just right for the interview. So we'll set, we've been doing conducting shorter interviews, uh, but potentially more of them. So rather than a 45 minute interview, we might do two 30 minute interviews, um, you know, with two different team members in the candidate. Awesome. Um, is there anything different that you guys are looking for in a candidate during a remote interview? Um, that wouldn't necessarily come up in um, an in-person interview, or are you pretty much looking for the same things? We're looking for the same thing. You know, we're yeah. we're looking. Do they fit within our environment? Do they have the the core skills that we're looking for? Um, I don't think that's really changed for us. Yeah, same here. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> What about, um, I, I know as, you know, former, former recruiter, I, I could usually tell pretty quickly if this is going to be somebody that I want to hire or recommend for the next step. Um, so for you guys, what is, what is that thing or that moment where you guys kind of have that aha moment and you're like, you know what, this is definitely somebody that I want to recommend for the next step or we're definitely going to end up hiring this person. Is there something that sticks out to you guys? I guess I'll go first. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> All right. So for me, it's it, do I need to carry the conversation um, in the first five minutes or are they engaged with me and are they bringing up relevant topics uh, to the conversation? You know, typically if somebody can communicate well, um, th that's the big thing for me is can we carry on an intelligent conversation? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it's, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's just still the same things that, you know, we've kind of all been saying, but um, being engaged, showing passion, um, you know, for what you're doing, not talking negatively about the process, um, and just kind of being, you know, as adaptable as possible. Um, and then, you know, to Jason's point, just you know, are we able to have a conversation? Is it, um, you know, again, like me leading the whole thing, just like you said. So um, I think we're probably all pretty similar in that. Yeah, I was gonna follow that up with, um, I usually start all my phone interviews, allowing the, the candidate to ask questions. And if they don't have any questions for me, that's, that's probably a red flag. Um, I like people who maybe they even know the answer, but still wanna ask just to confirm. Um, like, be curious, ask those questions, especially if, you know, if we're giving you the floor right at the start, um, like, let's, let's keep it, keep the energy up and going and talk and I'll, if I think you're asking too many questions, I'll jump in, I'll, I'll kind of take over, um, but definitely ask questions. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think that kind of shows the research side of things, how much of they research the company ahead of time. I've, you know, if I'm getting on the call and they're like, so what do you do? I'm like, um. <laughs> you know, if you're having to kind of explain everything up front, you know, just even if it's a five minute, look at the website, see what we do. Um, we're insurance companies, so you really can't mess it up. But, um, you know, just kind of doing some research ahead of time. Yeah, Sorry, well said, Jennifer. <laughs> no, you're good. Well said. That's exactly what I was going to jump in with. I think the, um, the depth of the questions is really that kind of turning point for me if they're very surface level. I'm not going to be as engaged as someone who's taking the conceptual um, parts of a question and taking it a step further to, to really bring something um, that they're really thinking through and wanting to hear from the employer about. Awesome. Uh, that's a great point. So, um, you know, making sure the candidates have questions prepared. That goes for any kind of interview, phone interview, on-site, remote, technical. What's one of the best questions you've ever had a candidate ask? I like anything that really gets me thinking. Um, so probably, <laughs> probably um, I like when people ask like, what's one thing that you didn't know before joining the company that you know now? Um, Cause that always, that gets me thinking. Good one. Yeah, I'd like questions too that are more kind of like future state oriented about the strategy or the vision of the organization. So for example, like where does Vanguard see itself um, in 2030 or what are the key things that are continue to drive Vanguard success in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, for, yeah, for me, it's um, usually, 
<laughs> yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> you and me, Jason. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say, I, I, don't, I can't think of, like, the best question I've ever been asked, but um, kind of just going off of Michael's point, like, asking, um, kind of putting themselves in the shoe as if they were already hired. So, you know, how would I make an impact to the company? Um, what do you look for, um, you know, or what does the team look for in terms of career growth, things like that? So just kind of already thinking ahead as if they are, you know, the employer already at the company. Yeah, and I'm pretty much in the same boat. I like candidates that take something from their past work experience and ask me how I see it fitting into our company. Um, so I do like that. And then, you know, true story, this happened yesterday. We had a candidate that did not do very well in the interview process, um, missed the first two questions the technical manager asked. But at the end, end of the interview, um, the candidate asked, what could I have done better? Uh, in today's interview. And we went from not hiring them to I extended an offer this morning based on that question. Um, the manager said, you know, she was self-aware. She knew she didn't do well in the interview, but she, you know, showed me that she wants to do better. Um, so she had an offer today, all because of that question. Up until that point, she was not getting an offer. That's awesome. That's really That's cool. My <laughs> favorite question that I uh, recommend for our students, um, but I, I think I word it as, what is something, you know, uh, do you have any hesitations um, on my candidacy for this position? Mm -hmm. um, and students are always really hesitant to ask it, but I love that question. So I love that you brought that one mm -hmm. up. Um, so I want to save time and turn it over to our Q&A. Um, it looks like we have a lot of participants who um, submitted some questions. A reminder to all of our attendees, if you guys have a question, make sure you use that Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and submit your question. Um, Andrea, what, um, what question do you want to start off with? We'll start off with the question, um, how would you suggest handling nerves before an interview? So I guess this goes both ways, remote or in person, but how can someone calm themselves down or is there anything you recommend about going into the interview if they're really nervous? I can take that and one. I um, so, I know you got it. For me, it's it, for me. It's all about being prepared. Um, you know, if if I'm prepared when I go into a meeting or when I go into a talk, if I have to be on stage in front of somebody, or I'm nervous if I'm not prepared. But if I know what I'm looking to deliver, uh, my nerves tend to just naturally go away. So make yourself as prepared as possible. And, you know, uh, th th that's the best that you can do. I mean, it's, it's normal to be nervous going into an interview. Um, that's not abnormal at all. Um, but if you're prepared, you can usually control those nerves. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to speak to, Jason, um, and wanted to apologize for the background noise of the phone and the background ringing. So <laughs> um, just the human element of, of working from home. Um, but mm -hmm. I wanted to also just share um, on the note of preparation, you can even kind of prepare from like a body language and just kind of general, um, you know, nerves perspective. If you were to either record yourself on whether it's the same platform or a similar platform, mm -hmm. just walking through some of the responses or your elevator pitch as you're getting ready to meet with that interviewer. Um, or even taking it back to like the old school days of just talking to yourself in the mirror and kind of walking through some of those mm -hmm. things because um, in essence, you're in these virtual platforms getting to see your image back. So it's kind of like you're talking to yourself in the mirror even when you're on here too. So a few of those can hopefully help to shake out some of the jitters before you get on live. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, understand that they're human too. So, you know, you, you're just talking to some, another person who, you know, put one sock on after the other just the same way. And, you know, I understand you're obviously, you're going to have nerves because this is exciting. You, you know, especially if you really, really want the job. Um, but, you know, on both ends, just, you know, have a, some conversation up front, you know, ha do you have any animals or, you know, where, where part of town are you coming from or whatever it is just to kind of, you know, have some of that talk before you get into the interview question. I was going to follow that up with um, just two things. So one, especially if you're given a link, like practice, like if you've never done a remote interview before, use that link in practice. The second is have a glass of water next to you. Um, don't be scared to take some sips throughout the interview too. It's a very normal thing. I think I've seen us all at this point drinking <laughs> some water. Um, that has helped me a ton. Even on the other side, sometimes like I can get a little nervous if, if I 
source someone I really wanted to talk with them and they're a big deal like I get a little nervous too so we're all human yeah no one can see your hands so if you have to play with your hands or something do what you gotta do <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Great points. Um, I want to follow that up. I know we talked about body language earlier. And this one, we'll start with you, Michael. Um, someone commented, Michael's camera setup can view the body language really well. We can <laughs> see more of your body, obviously, with your phone and how it's sitting vertically. Um, the question was, is that the way the camera setup should be? Or should it be like the rest of the panelists, which for most of us, we can see either kind of shoulders up or head up. Um, what's recommended and do you want to speak to that kind of body language question we talked about earlier? Absolutely, yeah, um, and it's a great question. Candidly, we received an enterprise-wide um, kind of mandate yesterday not to be using Zoom meetings, so this morning I was scrambling to just think through how I was going to set my phone up, so my <laughs> ideal and my preference would be to have my camera the same way as the other panelists. Um, I'm actually just using my cell phone for the video right now, so I was thinking through how can I get it closer to eye level um, so if I had the option or tools, I was kind of running around the house looking for things that would help to raise up the phone, I would ideally have my camera in eye level with me so I can make that kind of direct eye contact um, without feeling like I'm kind of hunched over and looking into the screen. Um, and I, I would say anywhere from like chest to shoulders up, um, as long as you can see your full head is great. I candidly have been looking at the self view pretty often just to be mindful of my hands. I'm from Philadelphia and talk with my hands a lot. Um, but then even to just the broader body language. So my, my word of advice would be if you are going to have more of your body showing on the camera, just be mindful of how you're presenting, um, what that looks like. So I wouldn't say there's a right or wrong, but my preference, if I had the chance again, um, would just be kind of chest and shoulders up the way that the other panelists do. I was going to say be mindful of your background too. Um, so depending on whether you're going to have it from Michael's view or from here, um, you know, it sounds simple and sounds like you'd already know it, but you know, don't have any like offensive like posters in the background or the TV going in the background or anything like that. Just try and find, um, luckily with Zoom and a lot of other platforms, I think we have backgrounds like what Sydney is using that you can put on um, if you don't have the option to, you know, eliminate some of those distractions, but um, just try and find a wall or something that so that you and the interviewer are, you know, looking around and looking at all the stuff around you. I, I do think the um, Zoom background is a great way to express yourself. Uh, I think we kind of touched on that earlier. Um, just be mindful. Uh, don't have anything on there that you wouldn't want your family to see. <laughs> so a guy shows our, our new campus we're building. I thought that was a, a fun way to show, cover my meds off a little bit. Um, yeah. So no, no Tiger King? In the background. <laughs> well, <laughs> none of that. You could. <laughs> none of that. <laughs> um, next question: Are companies hiring for remote workers with the without the assumption they will have to come into the office when this pandemic subsides? So, can you just speak to you know how you're thinking about the future when we are back in the office and when you're virtually onboarding? You know how is that going to work? And maybe speak to some of your strategy there and what you're expecting from employees. Yeah, I'll really go first on that one. So we, we are, you know, we're hiring as we normally would if we were sitting in the office today. Um, you know, it just so happens that because of COVID-19 that we are working remotely, but the expectation is that, you know, employees will, you know, return to normal, um, you know, as soon as possible uh, in the safest way possible. So mm -hmm. we are expecting them to come back into the office. Now we do have a handful of positions that are, traditionally remote positions. Um, so you know, it's something that you should inquire about, um, probably with the recruiter, before you get to the management interview. Um, probably not the first question you want to ask the manager, um, but definitely something you can talk to the recruiter about. Yeah, I was going to say for us too, I mean, it, it obviously depends on the position. If it's a, you know, a typical 100% remote position, nothing's going to change. You're still going to be remote. Um, but if it is a position that, you know, typically does sit in the office or the team normally sits in the office, um, you know, I am talking with the um, interviewee about that, um, making sure that they are willing and able to come back into the office um, once it's safe to do so. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, on the other side of things, you know, this is a story that just happened to us today. But, you know, we have someone who um, went down, he's originally from Chicago, went down to Arizona to visit family and kind of got stuck in Arizona. Um, and, you know, we are, he's going to be working out of our Chicago office. Um, so, you know, we set up a plan with him. Obviously, he's going to work remote in Arizona for the time being. But once, um, you know, we do start going back into the office, just set a timeline with him that, you know, hey, within a month of us going back to the office, that you would be able to, you know, get back up here and um, work in the office. So it's not something that, hey, we're expecting you by, you know, day two to be back in here. We're giving him a month. But um, just, you know, I, I would say you, even on your end, ask the questions, are, are, am I going to be expected to be in the office after this is all over um, or work remote just so, you know, on both ends, expectations are, are out there. Next question, would you consider it a positive or negative if the candidate spends the first minute or two in a casual conversation to break the ice and share their personality? Sydney, do you want to kick us off with this one? Yeah, I think that's a positive. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to kind of set the tone of the of the interview of the call and whatever it is. Um, I would almost expect that in person as well. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, positive. <laughs> yep, definitely agree. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, all right, next question. Uh, sometimes connection issues get too disruptive for the conversation to flow naturally. Um, so how do you guys, I guess, just anticipate any potential connection issues? Have you ever had anything happen, like you just completely lose the remote call that you're doing? And what would you suggest for a candidate who's interviewing, um, have you switched to like a phone conversation, for instance, and gotten rid of the video or anything that would be helpful around technical issues? Yeah, I can start. On I know. We, um, we, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Jeffrey. You know. um, so, <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, so we, um, we're using two different platforms, the first of which Microsoft Teams and the second WebEx. Um, we've kept WebEx as that contingency point of meeting um, in case the Microsoft Teams link or system does ultimately go down for both the interviewer and the candidate. So within all of our different um, candidate invites for interviews, we're going to have both the Teams link is like the primary way to join the meeting and then the secondary um, WebEx link there if, if needed. Um, and we've also been encouraging our interviewers to just to share if they're comfortable with it, whether it's their desk line that's routed to their cell phone or their direct cell phone number in mm -hmm. case they get disconnected from the candidate um, on both platforms. So to my knowledge, we haven't gotten there, but we've just been trying to be um, very proactive in educating our hiring managers to say, hey, be flexible with these candidates, recognize that you can't control um, some of those glitches mm -hmm. that do come with technology and don't let it influence the, the way that you're perceiving them in the interview. Yeah, uh, same thing, so. <laughs> Absolutely agree. We had a couple questions about hiring older workers, um, one specifically about age discrimination in hiring and one about, hey, will you hire a 60 year old? Um, these aren't specific to remote interviews, but maybe you could speak to hiring older workers and how you approach that or any kind of tips you have for older people that are still looking for really great jobs. I'll, I'll start there. Um, Come to BNY. Um, I, I, I don't care how old you are. <laughs> um, if, if you're qualified for the job, you know, and, and I'm not just saying this. So we're looking for candidates that can can do the job. You know, if you're looking to find a position for your last three years, um, you know, before you want to retire, that's fine. Um, there's a lot of knowledge and information that, you know, you have to distribute. Um, I think maybe during the interview process, uh, you know, you need to show what value you're going to bring to the team right away. Um, you know, if that's the, if, if that's the scenario, you know, it may not be, Hey, we're looking to invest to retrain you in 20 of these different areas, but we want you to work with us, be an expert in these five areas and help bring our teammates up to speed uh, with, with your knowledge. Um, you know, I definitely don't, not apply to a position because you think, um, you know, they're going to discriminate against you because of age. Um, if you're qualified for the position, you know, in today's day and age, most companies um, are going to hire you based on that. 
Yeah, I would absolutely echo that. Um, and, and at Vanguard, we've been um, just really thoughtful about when we think about diversity, it's not just ethnic diversity or gender diversity, it's diversity of background, diversity of thought. And I think that different people in different places of their career, whether you're looking to make a career change or just you know get back into the workforce after some time off or just make a pivot from one company to the next, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all really valuable and you bring a different lens to looking at problems um, that others who are either fresh out of school or um, newer to the working force um, might not mm -hmm. have. So um, to Jason's point exactly, I, I wouldn't let that be something that deters you from applying to a role. And um, same with Vanguard, if you're qualified for the role, we're um, very interested in your application, so consider applying. Great. We have an experience-based question. Uh, maybe Jennifer, you could mm -hmm. kick us off with this one. How often do you hire workers who are purely self-taught that maybe have a portfolio, but have no prior software developer experience or a degree or you know graduating from a, a boot camp like tech elevator so maybe speak to that experience level and how you vet those folks and how you look at candidates yeah so um it really doesn't matter to be totally honest um you know whether you're self-taught or have gone to school or gone through one of the boot camps um you know if you have the right skills needed for the position, then, you know, we're going to hire you no matter what your background is or where you came from. Um, you know, I think part of it is, of course, um, you know, doing your research too, though, if it's if you're applying for a position and interviewing for a position with a, you know, a tool or, te or a technology that um, you have not worked with before, then, you know, spending some time if you have it to um, practice using it or read up on it or whatever it is um, to show that you, you know, I, I think that's definitely something that um, on, you know, on, on our end, both myself as well as with some of our managers, National General, if, if you're showing, um, you know, that you went above and beyond to learn something, um, you know, that definitely weighs a lot too versus, um, you know, pretending the answer it or whatever it is. But, I, you know, either way, I'd say it doesn't matter if you're self-taught or if you've gone through school, you know, all in all, it's, um, you know, we can teach some of that stuff. So it's, it's all about, you know, your, your willingness and passion for wanting to learn it. Yeah, we um, have it uh, for at least software developers. We have a um, apprenticeship program. Um, so great for people who are self-taught, but maybe need a little bit more to get to you know, like a full-time software developer type of person. Um, that's the only role I think we have um, that could get people who are self-taught in, in the door. Um, but I think we're working on some other skill sets like data analytics um, and user experience to do the same thing. Yeah, and we have training Roughly. courses also that we can use that uh, employees have access to once they start, so. For us, the self-taught is, you know, it, it's not a negative, but it's not a positive in all cases either. So what, what we've found uh, a lot of times is when someone's self-taught, they know which buttons to push, but maybe don't know why they're pushing those buttons. So, you know, maybe going a little bit deeper into the why I'm doing something and maybe really stress that in your interview versus, yeah, I can code in HTML. Yes, I can work with Angular. Yes, I know Java and SQL and all these great things but why do we use it for this over that? So spend a little bit of extra time with the why and not just the how, and I think it'll, it'll carry you a long way in your interview process. Great points. I think there's a lot of misconceptions still out there that degrees are required for certain roles. Um, and I know at Tech Elevator, the more we work with companies, the more some of those restrictions are being relaxed. Um, and obviously they're looking at alternative education methods and even the self-taught developers in our case. So it's really great to see there's not barriers like that um, in a lot of cases. Um, we had a couple questions just about the remote experience. We had a question about eye contact. So I know it's kind of always the question, do you look straight into where the camera is? Do you look at the screen? Um, so you can speak to that. Um, and then the other question that kind of relates to that is someone asked around, um, they have neurological tics that could come across in the screen. So should they divulge that information ahead of time to let the interviewer know? So kind of specific to remote interview being on video, those two questions. Uh, maybe Michael, you could kick us off with those if you have any input. Sure, yeah, and, and they're great questions. Um, especially the one with the eye contact. I, I myself really even struggle with that because I find myself wanting to look directly at 
the person on the screen as if it's their eyes that they can see there, but continually kind of reminded to look back at the camera. So my suggestion, um, especially if you have multiple people on the screen, is just to continue to make that eye contact with the actual camera on whether it's your phone or your computer, because um, it's gonna then kind of translate through to the screen or, or to the people on the other ends of the screen um, that you're looking at them. Um, so as awkward as it kind of feels, um, just keep that reminder at the back of your head. Um, and then on the piece of the neurological tics, I think that's um, really important information for you to disclose with the interviewer um, if you feel comfortable in doing so. I think that's then just going to set up the conversation to be um, natural and just as, you know, um, kind of proactive in sharing information with them of what might accommodations you might need for uh, the interview itself. So even in the recruiting process, if you're comfortable sharing that with the recruiter and you're maybe not as comfortable with the hiring manager, the recruiter can likely work with you to make sure some of those um, things are taken into account before you even meet with the hiring manager. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> you have something to add, Jennifer? Do you want to add something? No, I just said I, I agree with what he said. <laughs> Perfect. Um, last question. I know we're getting close to noon here um, and it's kind of high level, but how can you tell if a candidate is going to be an excellent remote employee? So is there something, you know, I know we talked about a few things earlier, but kind of leave with this last piece of advice for candidates who may be interviewing. I don't know. I don't have one yeah. of you want to go first. We all look yeah, like we're yeah. going to talk. We're all looking at each other. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're up, Jennifer. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I don't I think it's, you can't really tell, uh, you know, unfortunately, everyone's going to put their best foot forward in an interview. Um, so, you know, it's going to come from experience. But I think, you know, just some of the things you may not realize, but if, you know, if people are organized, um, you know, prepared for the interview, um, you know, prepared in all facets of it, for whether it be from a research perspective or from, you know, um, how they, you know, got ready for the interview and stuff. I just think, you know, how they take care of themselves and, and, and that respect and how organized they are is going to show, you know, what kind of deadlines. And then also, you know, when you're talking about um, experiences and, and projects and stuff, um, you know, maybe making a, no, making a point to talk about how, you know, you had a deadline to hit and, you know, you finished it two days earlier because, you know, you wanted to do this or this or test it. Um, ahead of time or something like that, you know, just little things like that that you might not even realize um, are important to know can definitely show what kind of employee you're going to be as a remote employee. Yeah, those are great points. Um, I And I'm realizing I didn't share much of what I do in my day job in the start of the panel. So I manage Vanguard's um, National University Recruiting and Partnerships team. So I even pre-COVID um, had about 60% of my team working in different Vanguard offices and I actually sit in. Um, and for me, it's just kind of bubbled up in the pandemic to see that communication is really important. So, um, you know, just being able to proactively communicate what you're working on, or if you're not clear on something, taking the time to follow up with your manager. Um, so in the interview, as clearly as you can communicate, um, in my opinion, is going to show that you'll be able to kind of bridge this barrier of not being able to meet with people in person and still um, really understand what you're working on and how to partner with others um, in this unique environment. So communication is key. Yeah, I, I, there's, I, there's no crystal ball that tells us if you're going to be a great remote worker or not. Um, everything that Jennifer and Michael said, though, being organized, uh, communicating, in some cases over communicating, um, bringing up any past experiences, you know, the past is definitely a good, you know, precursor for the future. If you were successful working remotely on projects at a previous company, mention that, uh, mention how it was set up, how it was laid out, how you communicated, how you stayed, you know, abreast of everything, um, you know, try to give the, the interviewer as much information about those items as you can. Um, and that's really all you can do. Awesome. Jason, Jennifer, Mike, Sydney, thank you guys so much for taking time over your lunch hour to join us today um, and for sharing your wonderful insights on your uh, recruiting experience, specifically uh, in regards to remote interviews. Um, for all of our attendees, as usual, uh, we will be sending out 
the link to the recording of uh, today's panel via email. It will also be available on Tech Elevator's YouTube channel once it's up and running. Um, so if you guys want to share it with anybody else who wasn't able to attend, feel free. Um, and we will see you next week um, for next week's ses session, which will be focused on a deep dive into updating your LinkedIn profile. Um, and if you have any questions about Tech Elevator or interested in, in uh, possibly attending, um, we do have some virtual open houses this week and next. Check out Tech Elevator's events page um, for specific dates and times. Um, and as always, make sure you check out our career resources pages, uh, page on our uh, website as well, techelevator.com, uh, where we are starting to share some of our career development program contact uh, uh, not contact, uh, program material from our uh, <laughs> pathway program at Tech Elevator. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us, panelists. Thank you guys um, again. Uh, everybody have a wonderful week and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you for having thank us. You. <laughs> yeah. Take care.